Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Tea with Anne Marie. TGIF to you. I hope you all had an amazing week because it has been quite a week, and we are 10 days, let me repeat, 10 days away from one of the most important and historic elections of our time. Um, today, I am super excited to be joined by two dynamite dynamic, phenomenal women from our community, um, Senator Lori Berman and State Representative, um, I'm sorry, State Representative Tina Polsky. Um, they're, they're both running for office, or not running for office, running, for, well, one's running for a new office and one is running for re-election. Um, so we have a, quite a bit to talk about today. So let's welcome Senator Berman as well as Representative Polsky. How are you ladies? Great to see you. Great to see you too. Oh my gosh, what a time we're in. <laughs> Head nods right now. Like <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> so um because my audience spans uh across not just uh Palm Beach County but across South Florida and Florida and other places. I want to um, have each of you really just formally, just kind of tell us about your background, um, who you are and, you know, and we're gonna get into your campaign a little bit later, but let's just talk about your background now. So we'll start with you, Senator Berman. Thank you, and thank you so much for having me on today with you, Anne-Marie. This is really exciting. My first time on Tea with Anne-Marie, I love it. Thank um, you. So uh, I'm Lori Berman, I'm the state senator right now from District 31. I got elected in a special election in April, 2018. District 31 is from Delray Beach to Lake Worth um, and from the ocean pretty much to the turnpike. In some places it goes out to 441. Um, before that, I was a state representative for eight years from 2010 to 2018 in a district that was very similar, also a central Palm Beach County kind of district. Um, I'm an attorney by profession. I have a master's of law in estate planning from University of Miami. Um, I grew up in Broward County, so I'm a real Broward girl, and I was a total public school student. Uh, starting with Margate Elementary, then we moved to Plantation, and eventually I went to Nova High School. Um, so I consider myself pretty much a, a lifelong Floridian, even though I did go out of out of state for schooling for a while. Um, and I have I um, got involved in politics. I always was involved in politics in high school. One of my friends' fathers ran for Congress, and we all worked on the campaign. He lost, but it was so much fun. And that was sort of where I got the political bug. And I've always been interested in for a while. Um, before I actually ran, I worked for Congressman Robert Wexler as a legislative staff. So wow. I, I love politics. It's it, it's always been something I wanted to do. I waited wow. until I was a little bit, until my kids were a little older, which I'm kind of sorry that I did. And I would tell all women, if you want to run, run. Um, because we don't need to wait, you know, men don't get asked, how are you going to take care of your kids when mm. you're, when you're a, leg a legislator? Um, so if you want to run, run, do, do it. But, um, it's been really wonderful and exciting and I'm glad to be here with you and, and can't wait to talk a little bit more. Absolutely. Well, thank you. Representative Polsky. Thank you for having me, Anne-Marie, and it's always an honor to be with, um, my dear friend and mentor, Lori Berman who is, uh, one of the, was the first elected official I ever spoke to about me running. Uh, so basically, I'm like Lori, just 10 years behind her. Uh, so I am currently state representative for District 81, which is um, in Palm Beach County, the southwestern portions. Uh, but what's interesting about this particular district is um, it basically runs everything west of the turnpike from Boca to Lake Worth but then it jumped out to the glades. And so I have right now the three cities, Bell Glade, South Bay and Pahokee, and all the agricultural lands that um, are basically in between uh, those areas. And so I've learned an awful lot about agriculture and, and environmental issues, and it's been really uh, you know, fascinating. So I um, have been in office for two years and I am running for now state Senate. Um, not against Lori, naturally. Um, it's the sister district to her, just south of where she is, basically. Um, southern parts of Palm Beach County, all of Boca. It goes into um, 
to Broward, Parkland, Coral, parts of Coral Springs and all of Coconut Creek. And then Wellington and then some of the other areas I have like Western Delray, West Lake Worth, um, a smaller amount of West, um, of West Boynton. So pretty much the exact same area that now, just three times the size. Uh, this was Senator Kevin Rader's seat. And with his blessing and Senator Berman and so many others, uh, they urged me to run for this open seat um, because you know I have the experience being in the house for the past two years. Um, so I'm really excited for it. I won a very difficult primary and now I'm sitting in a general election uh, like Senator Berman in a, in a democratic district. So, you know, we're, we're confident, but, you know, still working really hard. So glad to be with you indoors right now because then I'll head out to the polls after on these. Uh, it's, it's just been just the worst week of weather for our first week of early voting, but I am so um, inspired by everyone who's waiting online to, to vote. Um, just a little background on me. I'm a typical transplanted New Yorker. Um, grew up there, but always visited Florida as a kid. And I've been here though for almost 16 years. Basically, family here. I have a 20 and um, husband. We've been married almost 25 years, and uh, we've been very hard to do this without him. He's um, basically my campaign manager. And so I uh, also, like Lori, did it a little bit later when my kids were very self-sufficient and, uh, you know, one was almost out of the house. And I found that worked for me because this, but there are other positions where you, you don't have to travel, but this position you have to travel to Tallahassee. And so, you know, that would certainly be challenging um, if I didn't have my husband at home um, or I didn't have some other help um and you know my kids were more uh, in need but you're always a mother so even in Tallahassee I was editing papers and talking to them and checking up on their homework and you know we know how to market talk so you know sitting on the floor looking at bills and looking at essays and that's pretty much you know how it goes uh, I'm a lawyer also by practice uh, I practice in New York but since I've been in Florida I practice as a mediator so I try to resolve Kate lawsuits before they get to a judge. And I really enjoy that work very much. Um, I've been pretty involved in civic and community affairs. And I only got into politics in the last, you know, three years ago, um, had been volunteers on campaigns. But truly what drove me is I am one of those typical uh, women who was really pissed off at what was going on uh, after 2016. I said, I can't take it anymore and was very vocal and said, what can I do with this angst? And it was suggested to me, hey, there's an open state representative seat. It might be perfect for you. And it turns out that it was. So um, here I am still pissed off uh, and wanting to uh, you know, run for Senate and uh, working really hard to see if we can get Joe Biden elected um, and Kamala Harris to the White House because we definitely need it. And up and down uh, blue ticket. So thanks, Anne-Marie, and you elected as well. Thank you, um, so thank you for having uh, us and uh, looking forward to our conversation. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, ladies. I'm glad I learned a little bit more about you today. So that was good, <laughs> both of you. So for women out there that are also pissed off, because um, a lot of us are, um, that may say, well, I don't know if running for politics is for me or how do I know what seat I should run for or how do I even get involved? Where do I start? Like, what advice can you give? Um, and not just women, men too, but particularly women, because a lot of times we have so many other challenges. Like you said, you know, we may have kids and careers and husbands and um, all these other components of life that make us kind of pause and say, well, maybe it's not a good time. Like, when is an actual good time? So what advice can you give to um, those women that may be considered are just like you said, is pissed off and want to know what they can do. So, um, go ahead, Larry. Yeah, so um, a couple different things. First of all, they say that women have to be asked to run, which is really unfortunate. And I actually was one of those people, and I'm sorry that I was. Um, and Senator Kevin Rader, who has been a great mentor to both Tina and I, was the one who asked me to run. Um, and I'm glad he did. But, uh, but don't don't wait my first advice is don't wait to be asked if it's something that you're interested in go for it um there is a great organization in palm beach county it's called she should run it's run by the women's foundation 
and they teach you how to run. They teach you what you need to go. And, and a lot of us are guest speakers. We go to those, we go to their events and we talk to you and we'll tell you about how you do fundraising and how you call all your friends and, and what you need to do. Um, so that's a great start. Um, and they, they help people run for every office. You know, you don't have to like say, oh my God, I want to be a state senator. You, you like, like um, Tina said, and I'm going to refer to her as Tina here because she's my really good friend. Normally I would say Rep Polsky, but she's and soon to be Senator, hopefully. Um, but she's my really good friend. So I'm going to refer to her as Tina. But like, as Tina said, um, you can run, you know, to be in our position, you have to travel, but you can run for your local city positions. You know, Anne Marie is running for Palm Beach Soil and Water Conservation. Who even heard of that before? I mean, so there's a lot of organizations out there that you don't even know about. And a really good way to get involved is to start going to your local city commission meetings. And there are all sorts of little boards that your city commission will have. And you go up to this, get to know your commissioners, and then they get to appoint people to the boards. And you, if there's something that interests you, you can go talk to your commissioner and say, I would love to be on this particular board because education interests me or the environment interests me. Or, you know, whatever your passion is, there's a place in the political scene where you will fit in based on your passion. Um, so, and I feel like the best training that most of us have gotten, and you know, I think Tina would probably agree too, is having been involved in your community. That's, that's, that's what makes you a better politician is having your background, having been uh, part of even just your PTA. Like you don't even think about all the things that you do in your community until you stop and look at it and you go, oh my God, I was a theater mom. My daughter loved theater. So I would have to go to all the plays and meet all the other moms. And, you know, they joke about the so the soccer moms were the big discussion a couple of elections ago. All those kinds of things that we do and, and going to your synagogue and your church and being active in the, in religious organizations, those are the things that have given you the background for activism. And those are the people that will help you. But if you do this, she should run program. Mm -hmm. They will teach you how to leverage all the all the things that you have in your background. And you said that's the Women's Foundation, right? Correct. Yes. Of Palm Beach, of, of Florida. Did they change to of Florida? I think it's of Palm Beach County, but I'm not 100 percent sure. I'll try okay. Yeah. Um, okay. I would like to add another great organization is Ruth's List. Mm -hmm. R U T H apostrophe S. Um, and you can look them up online and get involved. When I, after I decided to run, I took a full day course with them and they taught so many aspects of running and fundraising. Um, I agree with Lori 100%, like smaller things you can do in your community, look for opportunities for leadership positions. It'll give you confidence, it'll give you public speaking um, practice, experience, you know, be a, be a class mom, be a team mom. Um, that, gets you out there in public having to make decisions and just being more well known. And that really is the key. Like Anne Marie, you would you would agree, I'm sure, like you're running for this because you kind of have a platform and people know you. If right. they didn't know you, it would be hard. And I I was actually pretty surprised how many people knew me and supported me in my area. But my kids had been playing every basketball league and every baseball league and everything for so long. And I was a class mom and People just know you, and then they, they otherwise you're not going to, it's hard to get the votes, right? Um, right. In these lower positions, even state senator, it's not like everyone knows who their state senator is. So just being out in the community, um, I belong to the Anti-Defamation League um, Civil Justice Committee. There's various things that you can do like that that I think um, do give you the sort of junior league. Uh, there are certain groups that are politically active, like within Junior League or a group called Moms Demand Action, which is about gun reform. If you join them, you can be part of the group that goes to Tallahassee and lobbies. And that just gives you great experience and kind of knowing the process. Um, and just echo one more thing. I know, for example, in the city of Boca Raton, um, one of the um, city councilmen is away on um, reserve duty and his spot is open and they're taking applications from the community to serve it until March. And so what a great you know, chance to really get involved. And like Lori said, those advisory boards that different cities have um, is really a great way to get your foot in the door. And again, be known in your community. If you're known, then you're looked at, you know, when a position comes up and you might hear about it before other people. 
Um, and you know, sometimes you really have to be in on the know earlier to get out in front of it. So I think that's all really good, um, good ideas. Now, those are all great points, and thank you for those those tips, ladies. Um, someone put uh, in the in the chat, ladies in power, <laughs> and very true. So let's dive into. Let's talk about state issues, because I think a lot of times when we're, especially in a general election, we're so caught up in what's happening nationally with the presidential candidates. um, And we often forget about the importance of our state and local um, elections and elected officials. And so I want to kind of touch on a couple of things. One, um, because we do still have to educate our audiences. Um, everybody still is not familiar with what your role and responsibility is, uh, Senator Berman, as a state senator versus what your role and responsibility is currently as a state representative, um, Representative Posey. So if we can just do a quick snapshot on what that looks like when you're in Tallahassee. Sure. Um, let's start off with the Senate. So there's only 40 senators. Basically, we do the same job but we're in a smaller chamber and and we have a bicameral legislature like I think the 49 states in the United States there's only one that's not that has only one chamber so any bill or law or appropriation has to get approved by both chambers so what our big job we have one constitutional duty only and that is to pass a balanced budget and we do that every year in the state Um, All this other legislation that we do is optional, and we do usually pass at least something close to 200 bills on on an annual basis. But basically, um, we have the same kind of jobs. It's just a little bit more collegial and a little bit more, uh, we work together a little more in the upper chamber because there's 40 people as opposed to, I'll let Tina talk to you a little bit about what it's like to be in the lower chamber where I was for eight years and she's getting away with only two years. (laughs) Um, yeah, so the House of the Florida House of Representatives has 120 members. We each have about 150,000 constituents, give or take. And so the Senate's obviously three times the size for each individual senator, about 450,000 or so. Um, but you know, a lot more cities and you know, much larger geographic area. So, in addition to what Lori talked about with being in Tallahassee, by the way, we go. Um, quite a bit, but this, the legislative session is only two months out of the year, and it alternates between years. So this in 2021 is going to be the month of March and the month of April, um, and then it bleeds over usually like a week or two, like one week into May. And so that is when we're in session, and that's when bills are voted on. Prior to us being in session, we have committee weeks where we're assigned to four or five committees and bills are heard. Bills are supposed to go through three committees and then they reach the floor if they pass and then they're voted on by everyone. So a lot of people may have you know, seen the federal system how the appointment of Judge Amy Coney Barrett was voted on by the Judiciary Committee and then it's brought to the, the floor, the whole Senate for a vote. It's similar in the state. Uh, where it's supposed to go through committees and then the whole floor votes and it goes through both chambers. And at the very end of session, there's this back and forth that goes on to finish up the bills and it goes really late and the Senate approves it and it goes back to the House and vice versa until you come up with the final version uh, that both sides agree upon. But sometimes we vote on the bill multiple times until it gets to its its final um, form. Um, When we're not in Tallahassee, so that's about two months plus, you know, six weeks, give or take, you know, uh, we usually come back on the weekends, but we are there quite a bit. Um, We are in the district doing, I'll say, constituent services. Um, So when someone has a problem, most recently, you know, it's really been unemployment, for example, because that's the state system. When people have trouble, they let us know and we help them. And if it's a constituent that like I would share with Lori, because we do currently have um, some of the same area, then you know one of us will, one of our offices will work on and just let the other one know. Um, and we try to help our constituents as best we can with, with so many different things. A lot of what we've been doing over the last um, eight months is you know unemployment, 
putting out information. We both put out at least weekly newsletters with all the testing sites and what's going on in the schools and what's going on with business grants and loans and mortgage assistance and everything that the county and the state has informed us of programs that are available. And we're kind of like a conduit to tell people, you know, how to go about these things. Um, and then we also do stuff with our cities. We go to commission meetings, we help them. Um, we work with the county a lot. We have these delegation meetings about COVID every single week since the pandemic has started, um, just to keep us informed so that we can tell our constituents. So that's kind of, uh, and just very briefly, um, some of the differences are like what we work on, like some of the really important state issues, taxes, um, uh, school education issues, gun violence issues, you know, all those are state statutes, voter access, um, things having to do with right to choose, all of these things go happen in the, at the state level. So, you know, you may only really be aware of federal, but so many very important things that happen in our everyday lives, affect our everyday life, healthcare happen at the state level. Absolutely. Well, um, thank you for sharing that information. What, what are the hot button issues? Well, first, let me ask um, uh, Representative Polsky. Um, I'm praying that you are elected. But if in the event you're not, do you still continue to serve as representative in the upcoming session? Or no, did you I'm done. Okay. I had to make a choice. I had to run for re-election as a state rep, or I had to bow out and run for something else. So if I lose, I'm done. Okay, so we gotta make sure you win. What number thing I could term limits stayed in that seat pretty comfortably for another six years. Okay, so what are some hot button? I mean, we know COVID, of course, um, but what are some other what are some other hot button issues? Some bills that you are looking to sponsor and bring forth um, in the upcoming session because we're not that far away from session. Um, so, kind of, can you kind of give us a preview of what are the the, the hot ticket items or the hot bill items <laughs> that we're looking at um, in the next few months? Sure. Um, with that, um, I do want to say, I feel like, um, is it garbled? I'm a little garbled. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so I do want to say that um, we have a $90 billion budget. We, I think it was 92 this year, although there were some vetoes by the governor. So remember that we have the power of the purse and, and money. If you want to talk about where you're having the most impact in your community, money has a huge impact. And one of the other things that we do as legislators is we put in budget requests for your cities and your counties um, and, and for your nonprofits. Um, so we have a real significant impact on people's lives. People don't realize it and they look at Washington or they look at their mayor. Like, like Tina said, a lot of people don't know who their state senator or their state representative is, but we have a real impact on your lives. So please do get to know us because we do make a difference in your lives. So the hot button issue this year is going to be the budget, of course, because we know with COVID that we have to do a balanced budget and we're going to have to figure out how to do it with, the, with reduced funds. Um, a lot of our sales taxes are down, our tourist taxes are down. Um, I think real estate, I'm not sure how the that property appraiser's money will come in, but I don't think it'll come in, you know, so enough high enough to make up for the differences. Um, Personally, I want to see us look to how we can look to other sources rather than try and cut social services. Um, we know that Florida is one of the few states that doesn't collect the internet sales tax. We have no longer have a compact with the Seminole Indians. We used to get hundreds of millions of dollars for them. Mm -hmm. Expire. I don't understand why, and I don't understand why we don't get a new compact. I mean, there are some issues about gaming, but to me, that's money that our state should be collecting. Um, we can be doing some prison reform, which would save some cost on cr the criminal justice system. So I'd like to see us do some things to either save money that way or increase our revenues so that we don't have to cut social services. Um, I have already filed a bill um, with um, Senator Jose Javier Rodriguez to talk about the unemployment fiasco. So that's going to be a big issue. Um, one of the things that about Florida, regardless of even the connect system, is how stingy we are. 
We yes. both have $275 a week for 12 weeks, which is crazy. <laughs> the average state is 26 weeks and a much higher amount. So the bill does talk at, does increase us to 26 and talks about going up to $500. Um, another hot button issue in my mind, and we'll see if it is with everybody else's, is um, racial injustice. And, you know, we need to do some criminal justice reform. I think last night on the debate, I heard the vice president say we shouldn't have mandatory minimum sentencing. So that's something hopefully we'll look at. And um, I have filed a bill or I'm working to file a bill. We're getting it ready to create a statewide office of diversion and inclus inclusivity. I mean, uh, diverse, I'm sorry, of diversity and inclusivity. Um, and, you know, that's something that we never thought about before, but I think it's a great idea. We should be looking at it on the statewide level. There is a group that's forming in Palm Beach County, and we probably are going to have that kind of an office in our Palm Beach County Commission right now. Um, and then, you know, the same the climate change continues to be a, an important issue. We we in the legislature were not allowed to talk about it under our former governor. Mm. Um, this governor has started the discussion, but then I, I'm worried that we're going backwards. Um, so I'd like to continue to discuss climate change. And then the same issues that we had before COVID about education is always a hot button issue and fund properly funding our public schools and healthcare under COVID and the fact that we have not expanded Medicaid just blows my mind. It is, to me, in my 10 years in the legislature, that is the absolute worst thing and the thing I have the most regret about that the legislature has refused to expand Medicaid. Um, that we are one of now only 12 states and every time it's on a ballot, even in red states, they vote to expand it. Two red states just had it on their ballot and, to, and just agreed to expand it. It's billions of dollars from the federal government that we are, are letting go, which so from an economic point of view, it's crazy. And then the moral imperative of it, of 800,000 people who would be eligible for health insurance who have no health insurance. So it's really a crazy thing. So those are the, you know, there's a lot of big issues. I, I, I talk about the fact that we're in a time of four major crises right now, COVID, economic, racial injustice, and climate change. Each one of those issues are huge. Um, so we've got a lot of work cut out for us when we go back to Tallahassee. And only two months to do it. <laughs> it. It gets very compressed at the end. Like I said, you know, manic to finish the bills because they have to be done by X date. Um, a couple of things I would add to that, a couple of positive things and a couple of things on defense that I want to talk about. So um, we raise teachers salaries, but we uh, it was for new teachers. And each district is trying to spread the money out, but actually I just read this morning that our commissioner of education is stopping a particular district from spreading the money um, so that only new teachers get it, which is really ridiculous. So, um, I, you know, I don't know if I'm gonna be the one to do a bill, but someone for sure will do a bill on raising veteran teachers pay um, to make sure that if, New teachers got a 10% raise and veteran teachers would likewise get a 10% raise, just as an example. Um, but again, it's gonna be hard to find the money to do these things. That's the problem uh, with this upcoming year. Um, you know, I think that we will proactively try to put some police reform um, uniformity to how police departments are acting. Um, I know that some of the bills forward on that, and I think we can maybe you know make some progress there uh a lot of what we have to do as the democrats is play defense against some of the bad things that the republicans tried to put forward uh let me give you a couple of examples um one is you may have heard about this bill kind of anti-protest bill that the governor put forward this idea it wasn't an actual bill but his ideas and someone will put that bill forward they're even talking about doing it in a special session just on that i don't think that will happen but we're gonna have to play defense on that and basically fight that bill. And what if anything gets passed uh, as a part of that, like I would say, okay, increase the felony for hitting a police officer with an object during a protest, but everything else is ridiculous. You know, it's really um, eking into First Amendment rights to protest. The bill is very far reaching and, and really dangerous. So we're gonna have to kind of fight against that. Um, they continue to try to um, take away voters' rights 
you know, with Amendment 4, and that will probably come up. It's come up both years that I've been there, and I'm sure it will continue to because from what I understand, 67,000 um, ex-felons were able to register, and there's a lot more who um, would like to and should have that right. So um, th there is a lot we have to do. And, and the last thing I'll leave you with is um, the future Senate president, as long as they keep the majority in the Senate, has indicated two areas that he wants to work on. One is dealing with getting rid of our no-fault auto insurance. Um, I am not really sure how that's going to go or what that looks like uh, to our everyday consumers. We're going to have to do a lot of research into that. And the other thing actually sounds good to me, which is really uh, cleaning up water north of the lake so that when, by the time it gets down to Lake Okeechobee, it's cleaner. And then the areas that I represent are not blamed for, um, you know, bad water. Um, yeah. and that affects our, your viewing area very much. So um, that is a positive step, I think. We'll have to look into, you know, kind of this, this legal issue with insurance. Um, but those are areas he indicated he wants to work on. If he wants to work on them, that means they'll, they'll happen. Yeah. So I want to I want to touch on something. And I think on the federal level, um, Vice President Biden kind of addressed it when he was like when Donald Trump asked the question about why didn't he do certain things in, you know, the eight years he was vice president. And he was like, well, the Republican controlled uh, Congress for six of them, basically. So we in Florida and, and I think it's been for what, a couple of decades, if I'm not mistaken, two decades have had a Republican controlled um, House and Senate, correct? And governor. And governor. <laughs> so um, how do you get any work done? How do you get any bills passed um, in that type of climate? It's difficult. No, no question about it. So interestingly, um, so what happens is sometimes you have a really good idea and you bring the bill and the Republicans look at it and they go, oh, this is a great idea. And they steal your bill. So Tina had that happen this year with a bill that she prepared about Holocaust education. Um, so that's one way you get bills passed, because there's a lot of things that are bipartisan and that are good ideas. And they they go through in the end because they're they're bipartisan and they steal your bill. Um, it's very it's really tough. You have to, you know, get public opinion on your side um, really strongly on some of these issues that are a little more controversial. And a lot of really good ideas that we have, like I said, like Medicaid expansion, just can't get through. They won't go over the finish line because we have this ideological legislature where, you know, they, I want to give you guys a little breakdown of the numbers so you understand what we're talking about. Um, in the Senate right now, we are in better position than we've been in for when I first started, it was 12 Democrats and um, 28 Republicans. Now we are at 17 Democrats and 23 Republicans, and we have a really good opportunity to pick up two seats. And if that happens, we'll be 1921. And that's going to be a game changer because that means if one Republican agrees with us on something and we stay together, we can stop anything because a tie, 2020, a tie is a defeat. You have to have a majority. A tie does not work to do it. Um, in the House, I'll let Tina talk about the numbers, but it's even it's even worse. So it's really even harder for us to get bills passed. Um, we do work across the aisle. We do try to build consensus. We do. I want. I'm. I actually just had a meeting right before this to talk with my staff to talk about my bills. And we try and get sponsors from the other side of the aisle because it helps if you have a bill that's that's not, you know, that's a partisan bill. If you get some, I have a bill, for instance, um, it's called, I want to create a program called the Purple Alert. And it's for children who go miss, actually, it's not children, it's for adults, I'm sorry, who go missing, who have um, developmental disabilities, a lot, you know, somebody with autism, for instance, that's why we call it purple. Um, what happens is, you know, normally when somebody goes missing and they're an adult, they have to wait 24 hours. Well, you can't wait 24 hours with these people because some of them they wander off. And unfortunately, we had somebody in Port St. Lucie who wandered off into a canal. And oh, wow. um, so my that's a that's a really bipartisan 
nonpartisan bill, um, and I'm trying. To get, I'm going to try and get a Republican sponsor. I've try, I've done this bill for two years now, and it gets a lot of support. We just haven't made it over the finish line. Um, so if you can get somebody on on the you know a bipartisan a Democrat and a Republican on the legislation, that helps. Um, but it's tough. We we don't get through a lot of the things that we that we feel are important and good for the state. And I will tell you, gun control for that for eight years until Parkland happened, or maybe, I guess it was six years. Um, <laughs> so Parkland happened, I would bring a, a bill every year that was a good common sense gun bill. Um, things like limiting the capacity of magazines, things like saying you couldn't have a gun in a hospital, you couldn't have a gun in a daycare facility. Um, and I couldn't get a hearing on any of them, but I still, I still took up, you're only allowed six bills in the, in the house. And I still took up one of my six bill slots knowing that it wasn't going to get anywhere, but it made enough. It meant enough to me that I was willing to give up one of my six bill slots. Parkland happened and I had a bill that was pending for that session. Um, and every year I did a different ver a different bill because I figured if they weren't going to hear it, I was going to keep trying different ideas. And that year, my bill was for something which we called a risk protection order, which said if um, someone is a danger to themselves or to others, the police can go to court and have ask the judge to take a gun away from that person. And Parkland happened, and everybody knew we had to do something, and the governor did a recommendation of ideas, and my bill was in there, and my bill became the law. So now it is the law. Thousands of guns have been removed in the state of Florida using this procedure. Um, and I'm really proud of that, but it took something like Parkland to get that bill through. But so we need to just keep persevering and keep trying because you never know what's gonna be the tipping point to get some of this really good legislation passed. Awesome. Representative Polsky. Uh, sure, okay. so the house has um, 47 Democrats and 73 Republicans. So they have a majority uh, to pass a, a super majority. So there are certain attack the constitution um, that require two thirds. And so that's where we get a little power because we can stop some things. So I talked a little bit before about defense. And so sometimes just all playing defense um, is really important to stop some bad stuff. And we've been able to do that. The Senate, is like the final stopgap. So the House is, I'd say, more ideological, like right wing, and we'll put some. They'll put some bills forward that have never been heard in the Senate, so there's no way for it to pass. But they just wanted to hear it out, or I'm not sure exactly why. Um, and because the Senate won't hear it, it can't go through and become law. So um, it, it's really important to keep the Senate strong. It's usually it's a little more moderate. Uh, the, the people who are there. So they, some of the Republicans even will not vote for certain bills, or they'll say behind the scenes, we're not interested in this, so it's not gonna happen. Um, so it's tough, and you know, the outlook for the House is is always up in the air. We need 14 seats to flip it. I don't think anyone's really projecting that, um, but even a few more seats, you know, for us to get to 50 is like a magical number for whatever reason, psychologically, it's very possible to get there. Uh, they are defending a few seats. They flipped seven two years ago. That was really big. Um, lost a couple. So they're defending those and trying to flip a few more. And it really is possible, especially if we have like a big blue wave that happens in the state. And that will change things. Um, because of the makeup of the House, they have chair, they chair every single committee. And so they decide which bills get heard in committee, which bills eventually get to the floor. And so that does make it very difficult. But all that very glum stuff being said, um, a lot of the bills that we hear are non-partisan, non um, you know, not so contentious. Uh, a lot of business bills, a lot of, you know, agency bills, um, a lot of cleanup of statutes. And so, so many bills, I mean, maybe 90% pass unanimously. The budget passed unanimously this year because they finally did some things that we were looking for. And that's kind of like we pushed and pushed for years and years and finally they raised teacher pay. Finally, they fully funded affordable housing. Um, that all fell apart, but regardless in the budget, um, they did do some of the things that the Democrats have been looking for. They also do want things to be bipartisan. And so um, that's where we have some negotiating leverage and can get some things done. So 
Lori's passed a bunch of bills. I passed, uh, you know, an individual bill, co-sponsored other bills that have passed. So it's certainly possible. It's just we never have the same numbers that they do in terms of bills passed. But this is why state elections and local elections are so important. Yeah. You can't get important like gun safety reform bills, you know, done and things like that. So, you know, always keep an eye on those. Help out your state candidates. Um, Palm Beach County, you know, has mostly Democrats, so we're, you know, pretty good. But there are other parts of the state that are always, you know, like the St. Pete, Tampa area that are Miami area that are flippable and 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 we're trying. So um, there's always there's a lot of groups who work on that and it makes a big difference. And one thing I'll tell your viewers is, you know, we're in the midst of the most hugely important election ever. But two years from now, we're going to have a governor's race. And if we were ever primed for a Democratic governor, I think it would be in the next election cycle because of the debacle that Bill has been in the way he's run things. And he had a very high approval rate in the beginning, and now he does not. He's underwater. And yeah. there's going to be a lot of Democrats who are interested in that and some really good people. And so um, we need to work really hard to get them elected uh, because the actually even one more sort of depressing thing is that the Supreme Court used to be the real stopgap on bad laws. But because of term limits or age limits, um, DeSantis has appointed three justices, I believe, to the Supreme Court. So they used to be able to um, stop some of these bad kind of right wing laws. And now it's a totally Republican appointed Supreme Court. So we've like really lost all branches at this exact moment in time. So if we get a new, you know, a Democratic governor potentially in three years, they will be able to appoint some more judges. And just like our US Supreme Court, get back a balance. So that Cuban prayer race is everything in two yes. years for our state. Yeah, no, I, I think that the gubernatorial race for 2022 starts on November 4th. <laughs> it starts on November 4th. I mean, you just raised such a, if people don't understand when we talk about, we have these branches of government to create balance of power. And we have absolutely no balance of power in the state of Florida right now. None, which is insane to me. So I'm glad that you ladies are able to get some things passed and work through uh, the things that you're able to, especially in the nonpartisan issues. Um, I, I do have to touch on um, cannabis. I know that there are a lot of states right now, especially because COVID has pretty much like milked our, our govern, you know, our budgets both on state levels, local levels, et cetera. And there are states that are saying, hey, <laughs> maybe we should go ahead and legalize adult use. I know we have medical legalized, um, but what's your take on legalizing adult use um, cannabis? I'll start with this one. Um, I've been pretty up upfront that I think we should do it. I think we're desperate for the revenue. Um, nobody wants to see a state income tax. So if we don't have a state income tax, you know, we, we do need it. Obviously, people are using it, so why not make it safer and make some revenue? We are. Um, I also have these agricultural areas, and uh, we're getting very excited about the idea of, uh, the idea of growing hemp, uh, which is now allowed. Um, but I, I think it will be a huge economic boost, and so I'm in favor of it. Um, you know, I think we have to control the levels um, of THC, so it's you know safe, but. I think it's better to do that through regulation legislation than just kind of out on the street. Um, and we might as well be making a buck off of it. So, um, um, but the other thing I wanted to point out that actually Senator Berman and I um, just did last session. So you need a house sponsor and a Senate sponsor for a bill. So we work together on a bill uh, that relates to medical marijuana. So I think one thing that was overlooked when they pass medical marijuana, many things are worked and they've been cleaning it up since. But one thing is what happens in the um, in the workplace. And so a lot of places test for marijuana in their system and or any drug. And if you test positive, you could lose your job. But if you can produce a medical marijuana license and you're using it responsibly, it's not affecting your work performance. Why should you lose your job and not be hired for a job because you use that in your private life? It's a medication. And um, unfortunately, the bill did not get a hearing. Um, I think there's a real hesitation to do anything to increase marijuana. The second reason is they hate to add what they call causes of action. 
And so this gives an employee an ability to sue an employer over another issue besides you know discrimination on many other bases. This adds another element. And they just don't like to add anything um, that could potentially cause more lawsuits. But I view it as consumer protection uh, or employee protection for people who are using it legally. And I also viewed it as an opportunity for businesses to understand where the line is because they're in the dark as well. So, um, you know, we really, because there are certain businesses that, you know, for safety reasons that you can't use any medical marijuana. So I thought better to make it clear uh, and fill in this gap that the law, um, you know, missed the first time. Uh, but we didn't get a hearing, but, you know, maybe one of us will bring it forward again next session. So try, try to keep it in the forefront. And there's always a bill every year on, uh, you know, medical marijuana. I'm sure it'll end up being another, they'll try again for a constitutional amendment. That's really coming back to something you said before, that's the way good stuff gets done, constitutional amendments. And that's how we got amendment four, because uh, they never would do it otherwise. And they drag their feet on clemency all the time. Uh, and it, it's really such a shame. So there is a bill, I understand, for recreational marijuana. There usually is a bill every year, um, but I think this year, oh. There's um, a senator, a Republican senator, who's spearheading it um, with a Democrat in the House. Um, so I think this could be the year that we could possibly really hear about recreational marijuana. Like you said, it's a, it, we need income. This is another idea for income. Right now, medical marijuana has no tax because you don't pay tax on prescription drugs in the state. Um, we have an exemption for that. So, but recreational marijuana certainly you could be could be taxed. Um, I do uh, want to make sure it's done in a safe manner. I know there's a whole issue right now with our DUIs. Um, when people get pulled over, there's no way to test for medical, mar whether they're on mar marijuana or not, medical or not medical. Um, so we've got to, we have some details that we have to work out, but as long as we can do it in a safe manner, I think it's, this is the time for Florida to, to really look at it also. Now, when you're looking at it, because there's there's two things that I'm that I've been concerned about um, from an industry standpoint. One is the um, the barriers to entry from a commerce standpoint, where businesses, small businesses, or individuals who want to do business in the sector, it's very expensive. Um, the, I know with the medical, the just the applications for the license was like sixty thousand dollars or something like that. Um, and it was only X amount of license issued initially until there were several lawsuits. So how within these bills, number one, is it um, being considerable about how those, how it can benefit businesses, whether it's a small business, especially minority and women owned businesses that want to enter the space um, that is gonna be accessible, affordable um, and, 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 and have a, you know, eliminate any barriers to entry. And then the second piece is the social justice side of it, where um, how do we make sure that um, those who have been incarcerated and the families that have been impacted by those incarcerations are now made whole in some way, form or fashion. And I'm not talking about just cleaning your record, but is there like, you know, in Illinois where they had funding set up um, for those who either want to get a job and employed in the industry or want to start a business in the industry? How do we also make sure that those items are you know, included in the different bills? Um, I'll, I'll talk about the first one for sure. Um, so in the state of Florida, when we did the medical marijuana, and it was also done because of the citizen's petition, um, and, and that's why we did it, and the legislature hated it. They never wanted it. They didn't want medical marijuana even. So they made it as difficult as they could, just like they tried to do, they did with Amendment 4, and they created this system that, that's called vertical integration, meaning that you had to be the grower, then you had to distribute it, and, and then you had to the, to the people who were going to sell it, and then you actually had to be the seller, the retail operator. So you have to own it all the way through. Most other states, a state like Colorado, which was one of the first to do recreational and medical marijuana, has what they call horizontal integration. So you can be the grower, and then you can sell it to a distributor, and then the distributor can sell it to someone who has a retail operation. And there's no requirement in any, you know, in any of those situations. I think 
that at some point in time, hopefully sooner rather than later, Florida has to get rid of this vertical integration. It, it's horrible. It created the golden ticket, like you said. You had to pay $60,000, but then once you got it, people, somebody turned around and resold it for a huge profit because just yeah. getting that ticket was a golden ticket. And it's ridiculous. We don't want to create winners and losers. We sit in the legislation legislature all the time and they say, oh, we're not going to create winners and losers. Well, let me tell you, we created winners by <laughs> those tickets. So um, we need to do away with that whole vertical integration system. We need to allow a free, and it's so funny also because you hear about free and you know free markets. That's mm -hmm. the mantra of the of the Republican Party, and yet here we had an opportunity for it, and they and they limited it to their friends as much as they could. Mm -hmm. um, so that's number one. The second issue about the social justice, I you know I don't know how we can fix it. Um, I didn't know that about Illinois. That's interesting. I mean, what I talked about earlier was. Um, changing our criminal justice laws so that people get out of jail who are the, in there in jail for minor drug offenses. And I would, I think that's really important. I think we need to do that, but I don't know, uh, you know, that's an idea. I'm going to look in that Illinois law and see what else, but you know, it also is money. And anytime something costs money, it's, it makes it a lot more difficult. Well, I think they're using if and don't quote me because I need to read up on a little bit more. But I think there are other states that are proposing similar uh, programs. But I think the, the the premise is that you use a portion of the tax revenue and create this programming and this funding uh, for those who, you know. <laughs> yeah, interesting. Yeah, I think you know the, the state's a little hostile though to the use of marijuana. So I think even if they um, allow recreational, which I find hard to believe through uh, the bill process this year, but we'll, we'll see. Um, they, they're gonna make a lot of barriers to entry. They just don't want it. So say, oh, we're doing it, but it's so difficult, like you know, an expensive license, or they'll think that's their way of controlling it. Um, so it, it's gonna be difficult to do that. I also don't see the compassion in, they might let, you know, I agree that one of the things we could do, regardless of whether we have recreational marijuana, is release people who are in jail for marijuana offenses. Yes. But I find it hard to believe there would be a fund for them in this particular state. Now, if there, you know, a certain amount of the tax money is, um, you know, take is that you get from recreational marijuana is given to, you know, inclusion, that that's one can why you know people who are doing something illegal and okay maybe now it's not illegal but we're rewarding them i, I can just see it the way they act with clemency it, it, it it's just not the way they approach these matters so i don't necessarily see that as, as something that would happen in the near term even if we could get past all these other hurdles so it, it's an uphill battle for sure in this current situation they're very socially conservative um and uh, and and by the way they've been trying to um, cut back on um, the freedom of medical marijuana. We had bills this past year that would cut back on the amount of THC, I think, or only a doctor could prescribe. It was very technical, so I'm not an expert at it, but we had bills on this, or they stuck it onto, uh, like, they'll take a good bill and stick something on about medical marijuana just to make it um, more difficult to prescribe or um, less, I think it was less flexibility for the doctor. Yeah. So that's really not, you know, it's just not the right atmosphere for, for what we're talking about. Right. Well, I know, trust me, I know there's tons of work to do um, in that sector and it's not going to be overnight. But I think that we have to make sure that there's a balance on uh, both the uh, commerce side of it, the social justice side, um, you know, as we're as we're looking at these different bills and these different laws to make sure that it's an inclusive um Bill. <laughs> so we, we touched on quite a few things. Um, President election, and we have about seven minutes or so. So we'll, we'll talk briefly about the uh, we're, we're 10 days away from all of our elections, um, plus the presidential election. There was a, a hot debate last night. Just want to get your quick thoughts on what's happening. And, you know, um, what are you thinking? What do you think is going to happen on November 3rd at midnight? Or now it'll be November 4th, actually. So November 4th at midnight, where will we be? You 
want to take a shot at it? Sure, okay. um, well, I hope that the three of us are in our new positions, Lori in her same position. And um, I hope Florida has gone for Joe Biden. And if Florida's gone for Joe Biden, we can go to sleep knowing that things are okay. Um, you know, the signals are there that it's going well. The early voting, the, the vote by mail ballot, Democratic uh, turnout is still higher than what the Republicans have. And I just read today that I think even if every Republican voted, it's still possible for them to not catch up. I, I think I read that somewhere. So that's a little, you know, it's optimistic, but it would be very hard, I think, for us in Tallahassee to be living under, um, even if Biden wins, God willing, um, you know, if, we, if Florida stays red, because it just doesn't bode well for future statewide elections and just gives them kind of more sense of power. If Florida turns blue, I think you're going to have to see some moderation, right? Mm -hmm. uh, in, in senators and reps and in, in the governor, because they're going to be up for re-election and, oh, well, our state is turning blue. I can't be as you know right-wing as I was before. So um, I can't tell you how important it is for not only you know the presidential election, but how the, the fate of Florida will go from here on out. All these things we've been talking about this whole hour um, are, are up for grabs. And if, um, if Florida turns blue, even though the same people could be in office, it just will change the shift in thinking and really make a difference in how much we can get accomplished. Um, so I am very cautiously optimistic for the turnout of the presidential election. Um, you know, I, I think the debate was just showed how poor uh, our former president is on policy. He has no ideas for his next term. He doesn't have a health care plan. Um, he just has no plan for the second term. And I just hope people see it. I, I think they will. Um, but we all have PTSD from 2016. So who knows? Who knows? But it's looking good. And please, everyone who's listening, make sure not only, of course, you'll vote, but get your neighbor to vote, your grandmother to vote. Everyone must vote. Early voting is wide open. Uh, you can go on to the website, pbcelections.org, and you can actually see the wait times at different early voting locations. So you don't have to wait at the longest one that's the closest to you because none of them are more than a few miles apart from each other. Or do you mail, if you have your mail-in ballot, drop it in an early voting location. Do not mail it at this point. Uh, follow the, all the instructions and, um, you know, everyone, our lives depend on this, the outcome on Literally. the board. Yeah, I mean, I still have a lot of PTSD from 2016, so I don't make any predictions. Um, I we are Democrats have um, we are ahead in the state right now by 420,000 votes out of about four and a half million votes cast. Um, so that's a nice lead, but and also, but interestingly, nobody talks about the independents. Mm -hmm. Last time the independents, I think. The, you know, the assumption is if you're that the independents are 50 50. If you start with that assumption, I think last time they went a little bit more for the Republicans and for Trump. This time, the predictions are they're going to go more for us, but we don't know. So there's a lot of independents. Independents are the gro the largest growing party in the state. Um, so we really don't know where we're going to, you know, what how it's going to be. So we have to run like we're behind that we like we don't have that lead and we have to make sure like tina said get everybody out um i'm hopeful but I, i'm going to be doing everything we can over the next what is it now 11 days um you know to just make sure that we get everyone out and, and tina and i have been going to the early voting places and i will tell you it is really frightening out there there um i go to lantana library i've been going there for eight years now um, and I can't, I don't remember a time where I saw such divisiveness at a, at yeah. a early voting place. And there are just people yelling and screaming yesterday. I, they were talking about, some woman was talking about dead babies. I mean, it's really ugly out there. The things that they are saying are not true. And, and of course the people who are talking about these issues are not wearing masks, which is really scary. Um, and, you know, I mean, because a lot of them don't believe in science, um, unfortunately. Um, so, you know, don't be intimidated by them. They, you, you are out there doing your civic duty. Just go out, do your civic duty. We do have a voter protection hotline that you can call if you see any problems. And I know people have called in Pinellas County. They have police now 
um, which is not great. People don't like to have to see the police, but there were people at the early voting location with, with um, weapons. So they brought, they brought the police into those Pinellas County sites. Um, you know, this is, this is going to be, it, it's the next 11 days are going to be really tough. I joke that we should put Prozac in our water supply, but not, <laughs> not such a joke anymore. Um, you know, your, it, your personal it, water supply, that is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, so it, it's really, it's really hard out there. Um, and, but I'm hopeful that we will wake up on November 4th and all be really in a good place. And that's all, and we, we, we gotta put it all on the table and do everything we can to, to end up there on November 4th. You know, absolutely, I agree. And, and I do want to uh, give a shout out to uh, Wendy Link, um, who I think has been doing a pretty good job as our supervisor elections. Um, I was on a call, a countywide call that she did yesterday. Um, so for those who may have missed it, um, as, as Rep. Polsky stated, do not mail at this time. There are 29 location, 29 ballot boxes. Well, not just boxes, but ballot boxes and vans that you can drop your um, drop your ballot to. So you can you know find those on the supervisor elections office at every early voting location. There is a uh, supervisor elections van that will take your vote by mail ballot, give you a sticker, all that good stuff. So you can literally take those um, in instead of mailing them. And then of course, early voting as scrolling at the bottom of this broadcast is until November 1st. So you don't have to wait until election day um, because we don't know what our weather's gonna be like. We are in South Florida. <laughs> so um, go out and vote early today, all weekend, um, seven days a week. Uh, the locations are open from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Um, so we have to make sure that we make our votes count. Ladies, thank you so much. And I want to give my official endorsement. Um, please, please, everyone, look at your ballots. If you live in the with Senator Lori Berman, please re-elect Senator Lori Berman. She has been good for us. She will continue to be good for us in Tallahassee. And if you have uh, Representative Tina Polsky on your ballot, please elect her to be our new senator <laughs> um, in the Florida uh, uh, Senate. Uh, we need her. She's done an amazing job over these two years. I've had a chance to work with her and see her in action. Um, and so, you know, thank you both for all that you do. You continue to do. Thank you for serving our community. And of course, I have to give my own shameless plug. Please flip your ballot over. <laughs> Go down to Palm Beach Soil and Water Conservation District Group 2, and you'll see Anne Marie Sorrell. Don't worry about who else is on there. Just look for Anne Marie Sorrell in that group and <laughs> select Anne Marie Sorrell. And I thank, thank everyone who has cast their vote for me, who's reached out, called, text. Um, it means the world to have your support. Um, and please support these these amazing, dynamic women um, and continue to serve our community. So thank you, ladies, for this call, uh, for this talk this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you for having us. And you have our endorsement, too. Yeah. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. I appreciate it. So let's go blue. Um, everyone, vote by mail. Don't mail, but drop it off. <laughs> Make sure you sign the envelope and fill in that little space with your name. Um, and also, oh, don't forget your secret sleeves as well. Put your ballot in the secret sleeve, then put an envelope, sign it, seal it, take it in. Um, and then go to your early voting locations. Go to the supervisor elections website to find out where the locations are. And as Senator Berman said, you'll see the waiting times as well. So you have no excuse to not get your vote in. All right, guys, have a wonderful Friday, ladies. Have a wonderful Friday, everyone. And we'll see you back here as we do our last countdown to election day next Friday. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Bye. Bye-bye.